Everybody can see us. Was machst du denn da? Ja, Rückblick. Oh, oh, oh ja, da, letztes Jahr. What are you doing? I'm looking back. Oh ja. Oh yeah, a lot of stuff has happened this year. Yeah, we've, you know, traveled quite a bit. Dortmund and whatnot. Anyway, let the professionals Nexus. Uh, get the mic. Constanze, Nexus, Frank Rieger and Linus. Louder. Applause, applause, applause. Test, test. Gotta turn it on. I did turn it on. Oh, I turned it off. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the CCC Year in Review 2017. Um, this year, we're not going to do a chronological take, because that way it wouldn't make a lot of sense. So we tried uh, to do this uh, topic by topic. So we want to say thanks to our old location in Hamburg. That's what it uh, looks like now after we're done with it. Yeah, leaving such a location that's emotional. The 28th C3 uh, still in Berlin would have fit into the main hall uh, in Hamburg. Um, so there was a lot more space available there. So from 3,000 we went to 6,000 to 12,000 people um, within a couple of years and that's really something to be proud of. Uh, who in this room? Uh, whose first congress is this? Yeah, welcome everybody. Yeah, having these events become larger and larger is uh, only possible because we have lots of people supporting and helping out as angels. So, um, round of applause for them. I think that's sort of the core principle, uh, the way the Chaos Computer Club works. It's, uh, of course, this has a certain effects, and we're going to talk about those later. So we're not always uh, working together in a super professional sort of way because all of us still have regular lives, um, a regular day job, and uh, what we do uh, and what people do for the club is um, they do in their free time. And so um, if we're dealing with professional lobby um, groups, we really have to think about how we can um, handle such conflicts. And the question is, in this club, during these events, how do we create a community that still sort of is bound together, even though we become more and more and our interests become more diverse and there's yeah, different modes of thought and uh, of community here. And yeah, I think we, we're going to see that in the next few years, uh, not just at the events, but also in the CCC itself. Um, Especially during the, uh, our time in Hamburg, we've grown a lot. And uh, that was uh, on purpose, and we're really happy about that. And um, all of the different teams that, um, for example, Kaus Partinen, 
ähm, äh, Chaos, God, Fathers and Mothers, um, that um, try to introduce uh, newbies, especially uh, female ones, to these events. And I think that's one thing we all can agree on, uh, that we need a respectful um, w we need to be respectful towards one another, and I really think that's also worth a round of applause. We have um, first aid provided by the CERT. Uh, on a professional level, every year, and every year they become better and better. And they really can they're really ready to meet all uh, kinds of different needs and so again please a round of applause for them um, yeah we have uh, translations in different languages um, even for assigning <laughs> We also have a team uh, supporting autistic people. Uh, this has been unofficial for a while, but now it's an official uh, service. And these teams really grow out of the community, and it's it's mostly self-organizing. It's not uh, top-down. They don't need a lot of help from uh, from us, basically. And the the uh, the number of uh, angels at these events uh, growing uh, more and more is also something we're, we are very proud of. Um, that people think of themselves uh, as active members of this community. And for example, uh, the Young Hacker Day, we have uh, kids and families, and uh, we, we've created an open space for these structures, and that's really great as well. And this is a, yeah, a thank you to you guys. And we're obviously also very excited about the new playground that we now get to play on. Oh yeah, really, we do. And as we can see with uh, moving, there's a few things that you can uh, change directly. I mean, obviously, there's uh, room for optimization. And even if it's just a typographic thing. All right. In this sense, uh, this Congress is uh, a better version. So please forgive us uh, small uh, bumps alongside the way. Uh, those are all stuff that we want to improve on next year. So. It's uh, on everyone to uh, make these things better that this year we didn't run so smoothly yet. Um, so, I mean, not all stuff is unpacked, so. All right, let's get back to the classics of this review. Uh, the, I mean, the, the CCC is a big, big family that's a lot bigger than the uh, actual uh, association or club um, that is the core that deals with uh, the financial stuff and we want to quickly talk about this as usual the office in Hamburg supplied us with uh, some crunching of numbers uh, and they are like actually uh, dealing with a couple thousand of numbers uh, members and these are the new members of the last 12 quarters of the past. And you can see how the structure is changing. You can see that in the beginning of the year, there's usually a few less people signing up uh, in comparison to the end of the year. And you can see that the club is growing continuously. Uh, once again, this year, we uh, have a significant uh, 
number of new members joining the club and that is amazing to see that there's uh, people and that the mass of people joining is uh, is uh, is growing oh well you have to explain the anomalies the, oh you mean the January alone anomalies uh, well I don't know I mean it could be because I mean the, the next block is quite big it might be that the office uh, went on vacation in January to be honest I mean you have to see it this way uh, we have like also numbers of like how many emails are being sent out by hand, not automated. And I, don't, I have no idea how people are like actually executing these tasks. Like honestly, these that serve some mad respect out there. Round of applause. And I mean, we heard at this event that there's a few new members, donating members. So um, please forgive us if the office sometimes is a bit slow. Right after the Congress, that's it's always a bit like there's always a big pile of paper and I mean going through that and I mean all of that is also obviously voluntary based so please bear with us with stuff like that and I mean there are not even that many people in Hamburg so they're really busy so, yeah. all right so we try to uh, understand where the KS computer club is concentrated within Germany and I mean like we have a few uh, in clubs uh, abroad and local groups and these uh, are called alpha and they are uh, that stems back in time to the beginning and there's still chaos treffs which is chaos meetup and these local groups is where the Chaos Computer Club is happening throughout the entire year. This is where people get together, where people start projects, where they think about what we can do, where they come up with events, where they do initiatives, local press work, and yeah, normally create the social space, the hacker space that they fill with life. And that means that this is really the heart and the soul of the club, not what we show to the outside, but the but what's happening in the local groups where people get together? You really have to say in this at this aspect, like when we were talking about this, the content-based work that's happening throughout the entire year is, and I mean we'll get back to that in the end, is we usually have a block on the events that are being run throughout the year, and they are really done by the local groups. They're organized by them, and this is also what really carries this Congress. This is what, people, what brings people together and this is what basically makes possible that these kind of events, especially on this scale, also are possible to happen. And I mean, if you're here for the first place and you ask yourself, how is it going to continue, please check if in your city if there's a local CCC group that gets together. Go meet them, get involved. They're usually super friendly and they usually have an open door day. Please, like, check out the assemblies here, get in touch with them already here on site with your local group. And I mean, we have this beautiful tradition that people at Congress get together that have never ever met before in real life. So that's just beautiful to see. Yeah, there's another round of applause for that. All right, we also have uh, worldwide members. Uh, quite a few, actually. They are spread out, funny enough, uh, to the German-speaking foreign countries, but also other additional countries where German is not the first language. Uh, if you look at the global map, you can see that we're basically everywhere. <laughs> look at this map where all of our members are being spread out. But Nexus, you wanted to explain the colors, right? Those is not self-explanatory. Um, yeah, the office mailed us that, and we looked at it, and we like thinking about it, and we like, compared it to the list beforehand. And as darker as the colors, uh, that correlates to the number of members. So the white spaces are not spaces where we don't have members. It's just a place where there's a smaller number of members. And the gray ones is... Um, places where we have to seek members. So that's maybe an initiative, like a, a good uh, way of uh, what we are aiming for in the future uh, to really fill out that map. So maybe just, uh, you know, move abroad. All right, let's go into the topics now. So one of the main subjects 
where we had the most requests in the press department was two topics really. One of them was the whole complex around fake news, social bots, and the Netzdigi, which is uh, Germany's attempt at uh, controlling hate speech. Um, it's the Network Enforcement Act where they're trying to uh, work against hate speech online. And that was really hard. Like that, those kind of re requests about social bots and like a month. Like, I mean, last year we already had that kind of flood of requests on this subject. And I mean, like the DPA, the German um, news agency, uh, probably tweeted something about social bots. And I mean, one of the, I mean, this was a very big, big subject for our work all of a sudden. And I mean, like a couple of months in, one technic results uh, report was done and we were like asked to evaluate that and there were public hearings and non-public hearings and the whole subject, I mean, it doesn't even have that much meat to it. Like uh, the straight Trojan horse, for example, from the technical aspects of things. But if you uh, look at the situation that that kind of led to, I mean, look at the data of this picture. <laughs> you can just see his facial expression and how much we liked this subject. It's the 30th of January, and I am only semi uh, good, mooded, happy, and it's a bit just. I've been looked at with a bit of suspicion from the other experts uh, in the, on the panel. But I mean, that also shows uh, the role that the CCC has to play within these kind of uh, hearings. And I mean, we were a little upset how undata driven, how unfact driven the debate around this was. Like this year, there was two lectures. Oh, I mean, three. It's actually three. So three, three presentations on the subject. I think we are really showing how you can deal with this subject from an academic standpoint driven by facts and numbers and actually deal with the subject of social bot. And this changed a bit throughout the years. The debate used to be, well, the debate has become more focused on scientific studies that maybe we should talk about. And the hysteria that was there initially has left the debate. The hysteria about Russian opinion robots that brought us Brexit and Trump and that thesis was a, that hypothesis was a bit untenable. And there was one more thing we noticed in Germany and that was when the US Congress published and invited um, experts about Russian media mani manipulation. And that was a phenomenon we observed. We, s we looked at this and said, honestly, those few bots on Twitter won't have swung the election. Have you thought about targeted advertising, which is the, the business model of these anti-social networks? And we were the only ones uh, saying this. And interestingly, this showed in the American Congress uh, a few months later when it turned out that that political ads were paid in rubles and these networks said, yeah, it seems legit, you can do that. And this topic of social bots seemed to miss the point a bit. Nonetheless, it's obvious that the loss of trust in politics and media that's summed up in the term uh, fake news is a, a, a real problem. And it's also a real problem that interaction on the on the internet is uh, is not the way it's supposed to be and this network is currently failing to give us the the interaction and the exchange that we were hoping it would bring us and we are looking at this network in in some horror uh, seeing how people interact with each other 
and observing how the German government reacts to this. And um, then we uh, got into the debate about the Network Enforcement Act, where the German Minister of Justice, Heiko Maas, made a suggestion that uh, fit perfectly with the rest of his unqualified remarks. remarks and that completely missed the core of the subject. This Network Enforcement Act has contains exactly one sensible point, and that is that sites that publish user-generated content need to have somebody in Germany whom you can call. So a way to reach the operator when you have problems. But the rest of this act simply delegates um, the execution of law to the platform operators, which are the same ones who have these these ads. And although the, the government didn't want to say whom they meant, they didn't want to name any networks. Two things about this were interesting. And I was I was amazed how large the how 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 many people protested and how many organizations teamed up to protest against this. But also how little this opposition was found in the debates in Parliament. They they didn't seem to understand what the people out there were opposing, the, the reaction to this opposition was surprisingly small from uh, the federal government. And just to show you how large the opposition was, Volker Tripp from uh, the Digital Society, whom I called and said, the Chaos Communication Club has decided to join this uh, coalition. And he said, oh, brilliant. Just one question, Linus. If Facebook were to join the, um, the coalition, would you, would you withdraw? And that's how broad this, uh, this coalition opposing this law was. And that goes to show how manifold the, the criticism against this, um, against this act was and how many different kinds of criticisms there were. In uh, many different countries, there were. But uh, the German market seems to be so interesting that uh, the details in uh, technical and. Yeah, so Germany seems to be uh, very special here. Um, so basically, by law, uh, it is now stated that one has to uh, post that um, have to be a certain posts have to de be deleted after 24 hours um, if they violate free speech. Um, so, as a service provider, your this content is. Um, uh, is reported and then you have to decide is this a content that has to be deleted or not. So there's two types of mistakes you can make. If I delete the post but it would have been covered by free speech. Um, well I just I just had to be sure I had to delete it. Um, and if I if I say, you know, this is covered by free speech, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave this up. But then uh, a court rules that I, uh, I made a wrong decision, that it wasn't uh, covered by free speech. Then there's uh, tr hard penalties that uh, can be spoken out against me. So uh, deleting too little uh, uh, costs money, deleting too much doesn't cost money, so that you know, no one here is interested in hateful posts, illegal activities, uh, violence um, on the internet that some, you know, 
<laughs> weird people put out on the internet. What's really prohibited by law, that's, that's not free speech. But what really, you know, brings us forward as a society doesn't happen in, in the center of society. It's on the, on the fringes, on, uh, you know, in different shades of gray. And so, and that's, that's something we need to encourage. Um, and it's not always about, you know, agreeing with each other. And we'd really like to keep this discourse going and it doesn't mean that we we're on the side of some you know crazy people who can't think of anything else to do with the internet than uh, spew hate um, and this uh, network enforcement act you know it was called Facebook act most of the time in uh, the media and so the irony of us talking about this and um, uh, being asked for expert opinion, um, being the only ones in our society that don't use uh, this sort of nonsense. Um, yeah, this seems like some sort of zoo. Um, it's yeah, it's so it's slightly ironic that the Chaos Computer Club and uh, friends of the Chaos Computer Club are are highly likely to not be on Facebook. So yeah, all of this um, was much to do about nothing. The uh, government passed the Network Enforcement Act. Um, it's now binding law and it's already been in implemented. And how well this works, um, we could see uh, only shortly after because Russia copied the law exactly. And so they said, you know, well, this works pretty well. They can enforce their censorship measures with the exact wording of the German uh, Act. So, uh, you know, we're going to have to talk uh, to the next uh, German government about this. And what I'd like to point out is that uh, what the... Uh, what the government did they said that the the laws that we have in Germany aren't enforceable on the internet. So, by our standards, that means that we say that the you know our uh, democratic uh, structure has failed. Um, and this sort of thinking is really scary. And you know we can see this uh, in Russia how easily this is implemented. Um, so that's something to think about. So, uh, yeah, once more uh, about Heiko Maas, the uh, Minister of Justice uh, of the Social Democratic Party. I really hope he won't get that post in a new uh, government that might constitu constitute itself soon. So, I really feel he's responsible uh, even going beyond the Network Enforcement Act. It's really hard to, uh, within uh, German co political coalitions, uh, when we have questions of surveillance and civil rights, um, there's really no more equilibrium. When we look at the Ministry of the Interior in many projects that we're going to talk about later. Um, in working together with the Ministry of Justice, they, they really they, there really wasn't anyone defending um, the Constitution and the uh, basic rights in our Constitution. And that means I'm really disappointed in our Minister of Justice. So the normalization of surveillance measures, uh, not debating whether data can be retained at all, but just talking about how long and how much, that's really yeah, a, a great example for me to show how it's all going downhill from here. Yeah, one more thing we uh, noticed uh, during the course 
of this debate is that the ad finance networks are trying to create new rules for themselves, uh, for example, Twitter. And what we see is that this isn't about a um, uh, lawfully ruled state. By Twitter's rules, they would have uh, blocked Trump's account uh, long ago. But now there's an exception um, that mentions the, the term newsworthiness. <laughs> you could call that the Trump anomaly. So Twitter said that, well, we have very clear community guidelines. And if somebody, you know, uh, for example, um, uh, incites violence on our platform, for example, against North Korea. Um, that's uh, that's not in accordance with our community guidelines, but we're still going to leave it up because it is news related. So this discussion about Twitter is really related to the US and not to the Network Enforcement Act in Germany. But still, all platforms really um, reacted to political pressure, even YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, but for Twitter, the, the fact that they have this exception of newsworthiness is really interesting because that's really uh, a marker for the year 2017, a distinctive feature. We have a precedent uh, that has no respect whatsoever for all different forms of decency and who still surprises me by the, with his uh, political communication. And then on Twitter, of course, um, Trump is a problem, even internationally, because he goes against the community guidelines and incites violence and posts hate speech. So, yeah, we can sum up these rules. We don't like hate speech and uh, post it inside violence, but if it brings clicks, oh, it's all right. Um, so, yeah, when they were asked about it, Twitter uh, said that there, were, there was a two-step change um, to the community guidelines. Um, so it wasn't just about uh, text uh, uh, posts, it was also about uh, hate symbols, for example, the swastika. Um, Twitter doesn't differentiate between rules in Europe and rules in the US, which also means that the stronger free speech rules in the US also apply to Europe, um, which is different than Facebook, obviously. Um, yeah, do we stick to the ad networks? Yeah, um, what happens is that censorship and uh, the removal of hate speech, um, the responsibility for that is dumped on the corporations. And so for them, of course, uh, it, it's an incentive to automate uh, that procedure because every uh, every job obviously costs money, um, a lot more than some CPUs and some data center. So there's lots of lots of automatic uh, detection of hate speech going on, which re invites a uh, discussion we had in the 90s where we had uh, people walking around with uh, crossed out swastikas or swastikas being thrown in a cr trash can. So clear statements against uh, Nazis. And these people uh, were all alone on the uh, list of uh, uh, on police lists of offenders against uh, unconstitutional sim for the use of unconstitutional symbols um, so we can see the same thing happening today on Facebook and Twitter um, because a swastika it's you know it's very easy for an algorithm to find and the exact same thing is also, for example, we can see with Kurds in uh, Turkey. Uh, so, um, free speech on the big ad-based networks uh, isn't enforced right now because as soon as you have uh, images of people belonging to a 
Kurdish party, uh, these posts get removed automatically. So what we have here is really a development of legitimized by the state uh, the development of these corporations turning into the instruments of power that decide what can or can't be said. And that's something that shouldn't happen. All right. A good aspect is to see that uh, in this whole debate on fake news that we experienced this year and witnessed this year, we are capable to move forward and go into subjects that the politics uh, are, have slept on for many, many years that are we now trying to put on the agenda and are trying to move forward. Um, a round of applause. We have this uh, project Chaos Does School uh, that last year had a talk that was very well received and they were back this year and I think I've heard really good stuff about it and we have in the beginning of this year um, starting from the team Chaos Does School we kind of also put our own uh, um, efforts in and we, we demanded uh, and we generated demands of how a modern digital school is supposed to look like. Because if we look at what's actually going on uh, with regards to smart boards where you literally have to explain to teachers how they function in their core simple functionalities and you like really have to pay attention that they might not uh, like get on them with uh, whiteboard markers. So uh, digital education uh, for uh, teachers, for people who train to become teachers, uh, we really see, we can see what happens when you sleep on your education um, policies and when you sleep on the education of teachers. And you really have to get a feeling for how, what we used to have with newspaper articles, like that we kind of did that fact check, uh, but on the internet, like all of a sudden these news come in faster and we kind of don't do this. And like starting there, it's important, like we really, it's really important to start with school education, with high school education. And if you start with high school education, you have to start with the education of teachers and professionals who are teaching. And that means that you have on a federal state level have to get people to in influential positions to really start executing this on a political level because Germany is a decentralized state, so um, education is a decision based on federal state. And it's like every once in a while, there's like people come up to us and address us and they ask us, so what do you want to say about this? And like our usual response is like, well, the politics really need to wake up. They have there's this thing called the internet. Like this is not a subject that needs to be pushed into computer science in a course for half a year. This is a subject that needs to be a part of every subject being taught in school. Like this is a very fundamental thing going into every aspect of life. Round of applause. And obviously, this has not reached school, and that in history, there's that articles from the internet are being read that you have to deal. Uh, about in ethics and philosophy, what does internet do with society? Within language classes, you have to, like, how can you not, like, access translation software and dictionaries from online? Like, there's so much internet online that's useful for students. Like, what we did was we wrote down demands to, so that we can get students to become active, aware members, they don't need to necessarily know how to program, but they need to start understanding how the internet functions and how these structures work and integrate that within subjects, all of the subjects, and that's what matters. And it's we need to back up teachers and, and go into the universities and have that being part of the academic agenda and curriculum that so that teachers can get help and get people in touch with people like uh, Chaos Jazz School, like get them in touch with independent groups like us who are not advertised driven, who are not big companies. We really need to, like I mean in the US it's very common that you decide between Facebook uh, and Google and we don't want that in Germany. It needs to be clear that digitalization is something that is an individual development and that's something that we need to separate from commercial structures, especially when it comes to the level of high schools. A round of applause.
Und wir haben so ein bisschen die Hoffnung, And we have the hope that with our demands we at least reach the one or other person and maybe even get a ball rolling somewhere. I mean, you, you, you really realized that the other day, like that, you realized that it was like a very important project for me that chaos to school. And I just admire, see this project growing every year. And at the same time, I ask myself, What is it? What is it that in 2017, like we as the CCC have to get our voluntary people to spend their free time to go into the schools to do like a day of media competence? How do we still need to get that out of our voluntary resources, like from the brilliant people that work with us in 2017? I mean, this discussion has been, in the past year, we had this discussion like, dass man die Existenz des Internets vor den How Schülerinnen nicht mehr verheimlicht. was a question, like one of the questions, wird, uh, whether or not we should dann, still keep the Internet the and the existence of Internet a secret. And then you have the Philology uh, Association and they, they go and they are like, oh, you should just pick up a book for a change. And when you think about these schools that we kind of uh, put money in as a society and we kind of think of as necessary and are like, Their overall goal is to generate resourceful, active members for our future societies that need to move all of us forward. Like, how can we like think about keeping the internet secret from us, from them? Like, from the first grade on, you need to do what Chaos does. School is in very motivated but very exhausting voluntary work is doing. The, but that's really not what voluntary work is supposed to do. It's not supposed to pick up the pieces from where politics and politicians fail society on a daily basis. Round of applause, but thank you, Chaos Just School. We really need you guys. I really want to summarize that. It's really bitter and just hard to see that. I mean, it's it's really gone crazy last year. Like, all of a sudden, they've becoming a lot of attention. And it's really, really sad to see that Chaos Does School can do a thousand times more than what our education politics manages to do in the past 14 years. A round of applause for that from the audience. I'd like to uh, take this moment to mention that Chaos to School is not alone. I mean, there's like... Whoever was at one of these events from Jugendhakt or Coda Dojos, like there, there's obviously more than just Chaos to School. And the multiple crypto parties, I mean, it's a whole scene by now that is like organizing this regularly, even for also education for grown-ups, like for just people who want to get informed, like beyond, sometimes even state help, there's like a scene that has grown that publicly takes on this 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 issue and I'm really really happy that we like there's a talk from yesterday that chaos just school did yesterday like that it was so well received and then they got such great feedback round of applause from the audience coming in now and you d d please don't forget that planning of these kind of education bureaucracy is done by people who think that in computer science you should mainly learn how to handle Microsoft Office uh, software I mean like I was uh, honestly a bit of sh in a bit of a state of shock like to really show the extent of this like I'm sorry that we have to like keep writing this horse. But the time window uh, of when there's sort of developments that happened, like the, within between people that had the first own computers and then had internet access to uh, smartphones, the people that experienced that kind of transition and change and had the possibility to understand how these changes are interconnected and how they're changing. And like, it's so normal for you guys because you've seen the development of these things and where all of that came from like how that computer actually works. Like that time window is so tiny and the tiny humans that are growing now, they're just getting this lighting board that's looking at them and they can just swipe left and right and somebody needs to explain to them what this is. That they don't think Like they need to understand that it's not just a magical thing and they need to, we need to take the power away from the people who program these machines for them. They need to start understanding these machines. 
And there's a big round of applause for that last statement. So, come here. All right, let's uh, get back to other subjects, like our central competences. <laughs> Hacking, obviously, is our daily bread. Uh, I almost said uh, and I actually didn't. Uh, we're a hacking group, we're a hacker club, we're going to stay that way, and we're going to hack other hackers, and in this case, the state. So the state-run Trojan horse has been a long-lasting subject for us. For us, for years now, we have been pushing our ideas into what's going on there, and I mean, like, it's been a very exhausting kind of process, and this time around, we were invited to to um, give our statement. Oh no, the statement was on the 31st of May and on the 29th of May I got the invitation um, that kindly asked me to show up on Wednesday on the 31st of May to uh, show up for a change in the law, um, blah, 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 blah. And I mean, this is about in a very long STPO novella, I mean, there's, like, there's been going through all the justice um, committees. In the last minute, they had all of a sudden tried to implement and include a state-run Trojan horse. Like, this is something that they did last minute, kind of like a Houdini. I mean, everybody kind of agreed that for many years, this is what they were trying to get to agree upon. And they were like, oh, great. Like, it's now an end of legislation is coming up. And I mean, it's great. Now we're like, we need to push this. We need to make the decision on this because otherwise this is not going to happen because, I mean, the governmental elections were coming up. And this is the moment. Um, so STPO is the official um, process order of um, how law is being executed. Okay, so all of a sudden they're like, let's push this because legislation is ending and there's elections. So all of a sudden they come up with a formulation and hand it down to the parliament itself and this is how they need to and are supposed to formulate the law. And I mean, it's great that the executive is helping the legislative. Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, with uh, helping them out with the formulation. And this is what it meant for us. Last minute uh, statements, of course, we're going to thankfully and happily uh, come and take part in this. So uh, the implementation of a state-run Trojan horse basically looks like paragraph 104, uh, changing word number B5. He's literally listing uh, the actual uh, law now, and it's really hard to translate that because he's going very fast. So for anybody interested, uh, read up on uh, what they were trying to implement. Go on Linus's Twitter and look for that tweet. Okay, so the introduction of um, these new cuts on our fundamental rights are being handed to you as a diff, basically, so that you don't understand them within the context. Like, you literally get the pieces that were changed. You basically better get a diff with comments, but uh, without any context. And I mean, the problem with this is that not even the um, the people, the members of the parliament are getting, like, the full context of this, and they're reading all of this. So the moment when we, uh, when we found out about this, we were, like, marched towards parliament to the parties, and we were like, what the heck? Like, you can't really be serious about this. I mean, we've been working on this for a couple of years now. Like, normally, like, you have recursive rounds, you discuss stuff, and then this party and this party informally kind of gives, like, their opinion, and, like, what happened this time around? And, like, all of a sudden, this was just done kind of like style of the U.S. Americans, like, just, just last minute without, like, sneaking it in through a back door, basically. The changes of the law and the social democrats basically refused to discuss this with us and I mean like the justice ministry didn't say anything against this nothing I mean what do you mean against this I mean that's where the formulation helping came from I mean what happened there was is, is the worst case scenario in the parliamentary democracy that we can we've witnessed Linus mentioned in the beginning that we've been fighting about this state-run Trojan horse for like 10 years we remember there is two um, laws 
uh, two two prosecutions uh, on a constitutional law ground, and the second ruling. Over the course of these 10 years, it was very clear that state-run hacking and state-run Trojan horses are in connection to, to terrorism. But what we have here in the change of the law is a broadening of this law that goes much, much, much further than having something against terrorism. Like it takes takes into account everything. Like. For, like forfeiting documents, like very r little offenses. So for they were trying to basically get in by another they were trying to push this through the back door and the, peop the experts who could have could have contributed to this got a got a time frame that was completely ridiculous and we've 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 uh, had a landslide without parallel in, um, regarding how how it's allowed to hack our computers. And just to stress this point, they've been coming to us for years. Yeah, it's only only for terrible ter terrorists. And of course, we have to protect the protect privacy. But this, this is no longer the case. And we, we're looking forward to fighting this uh, in front of the Constitutional Court, because there are going to be constitutional complaints against us, and several of them. Aber wir lassen es ja mit uns machen, haben dann in anderthalb Tagen Zeit, 20 Seiten zu uh, formulieren. Some, some, uh, some thoughts on this and Constanze and Frank helped me out a lot. Wir gehen zwar davon aus, dass, weil natürlich alle unsere Stellungnahmen immer auch auf ccc.de stehen, die alle gelesen haben. Because all of our statements are on C, uh, can be found on ccc.de. In Erinnerung habt, wir haben natürlich inhaltlich neue Schwerpunkte gesetzt, denn die IT-Welt hat sich verändert. Wir haben früher sehr intensiv über We discussed this very intensely earlier and privacy that we talked about a lot and uh, preventing hacking and uh, what's the personal we have four years of Snowden behind, uh, behind us we have questions of IT security Markt, der einer ist, wenn wir über Exploits if, und über den Handel von Sicherheitslücken reden, wenn er sich dort mit Unsuchung scheuert, dann hat er auch eine Form von ökonomischer Incentivierung. Also wir haben, glaube ich, ganz andere Schwerpunkte gesetzt, als wir... If our tax money is used for this, then it's a case of uh, economic incentivization. And I, I think this field has grown and... ...ist auch, auch wenn wenig Zeit war... Even if there was little time, we uh, succeeded in changing the debate of, uh, of changing the agenda of the debate. And these things aren't just being done with us. This is a letter from the um, Federal Data Protection Officer that's uh, submitting her point of view to, uh, to the Work group. Unfortunately, the ministry avoided asking me for a comment on this change to the law. I was only informed about this through the media on the 17th of May. So the Federal Data Protection Officer uh, found out about this in the media, and that medium was netzpolitik.org, where this proposed change of law was leaked. And in light of the considerable privacy implications of this, I cannot understand how I was given such a short time frame to, uh, to add my comments, and therefore I have to restrict myself to certain corner points. But at least um, <laughs> we were very surprised by these strongest words that are federal Data Protection Officer was able to find, which is very unusual. Or you could say that it was so terrible that even the Data Protection Officer said something.
Und ja. Wir haben ja ungefähr schon gesagt, dass wir das für einen mittelschweren Skandal halten. And aber um we probably ja. made it clear that uh, we consider aber this a uh, massive machen. scandal, but genau. well, at the end of the day you can, uh, you can still be made a fool of. The German Conservative Party, the CDU, comes along and uh, pokes fun at this. I mean, th this is ridiculing the entire parliamentary process, and then they didn't even have the balls to keep this tweet up, but they deleted it. I mean, I don't know what, what marketing agency the party has, but... This was a great reply from uh, from from us. So, was man dazu noch sagen muss, um, wir reden hier so von Ende Mai, ne? Und uh, das heißt also, and da war so die Zeit, wo about the end of war, so May, and that was the time when all the parties realized hmm, there's a election coming up, and the evil cyber rushing Russian is uh, standing at the gates. E and um, halt they were worrying that their email exchanges might be hacked and leaked like Hillary's. And what's fascinating was that the connection between you're trying to push out, push through this uh, cyber, tra uh, this Trojan horse, and you're, <laughs> you're worried about the Russian cybering you, was was completely missed by the parties. And the month of WannaCry in May was um, the, May was also the month of WannaCry, and that we didn't manage to con connect that. But we'll get to that later. Von diesem Beschluss weg the yeah. so they, uh, they tried to push the debate away from this. It didn't quite succeed. And of course, um, this horrible example was repeated in, uh, in uh, some of the state legislations and we were very happy that uh, the state of Hess saw many 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 local initiatives of the CCC gathering to um, to protest this the CCC's press team tends to deal with federal politics most of the time but it was great to see that we can work together on this and that we can that there are topics that um, simply can, uh, concern um, certain certain federal states that can still be supported by the uh, by by press releases and we're going to keep track of this and um, trying to prevent this state trojan from entering more state laws because somebody has to clean up behind this by um, submitting constitutional complaints and we don't have unlimited capacity. We, we tried this in Hess and they, they are very active and we are quite proud of them. We need to hurry a bit. I'm going to say very little about this very quickly. There was one debate during Republika in Berlin where the then Minister of the Interior, Thomas de Maizière, um, joined the debate. And you know, this is the minister who um, did the net political discourse in his first term of office, and of course, all of this has been forgotten. All, also, the papers that resulted out of these dis dialogues that showed a bit more balanced view on uh, net regulation. First of all, he gave a very boring talk before the actual discussion, but he did allow discussion about the kind of surveillance that he um, has to answer for, especially data retention that um, is a result of his term of office, but also biometric data and how we talk about simply retaining data by default and how much he pushed that agenda. I um, 
found that the debate was um, not very productive. I miss this echo because there isn't a lot of um, debate within the political coalition. This may change with the new uh, with the new government because it's no longer going to be a grand coalition but simply a coalition of the Conservatives and Social Democrats. I mean, I'm not not very thrilled about the fact that uh, the leader of the opposition is now the right-wing AfD party. I mean, a lot of this was connected to the uh, to the uh, refugee crisis in a horrible way, who, because I thought it was awful that the established parties were trying to were we're being overwhelmed by this right-wing discourse and we're going to have to work against this. It's not going to get any better. But let's talk about something positive for a change. I would like to show you this brochure as an example. This brochure comes from the Swiss Chaos Communication Club. It's been downloaded heaps of times and it proves how much demand there is even if there's not, uh, even if the politics doesn't reflect this, but um, this kind of digital literacy or digital emancipation is something that we think is very important, and it's been. We, we hope that these offers by the CCC that make digital know-how more accessible will be um, will will be something that we get more of in the future. And thank you very much to the Swiss CCC. Also, one of the things that we must not forget about all these things. Yeah, what we mustn't forget is that you know. Um, protesting all of these awful decisions can also be quite fun, otherwise it would be pretty boring. And so uh, the stuff happening at Südkreuz uh, area in Berlin, where the government is trying to establish mass surveillance uh, in ev people's everyday lives with a uh, public test. Um, so there's uh, facial recognition going on there and that's fed into some sort of system and uh, people could sign up for that. And there was a really nice protest against this, um, more than one even, where people wearing all sorts of masks um, and uh, Holding out signs uh, showed up. So yeah, these were these were different protests. Uh, protests. These were different days. So we had uh, Spider-Man, um, Spider-Man costumes uh, with masks. Um, we can't uh, you can't see them here, but it was it was great. It was colorful. It was. Uh, yeah, so we arrived during the break and uh, because the, the minister uh, showed up there uh, two times uh, for uh, looking at this and uh, the people just went up and down this, uh, the escalators and yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. So I think that's just something uh, something we need from time to time to not, you know, fall into some kind of hole. Um, because our Minister of the Interior uh, said on camera that he didn't just wish for uh, the sort of surveillance uh, to be widespread, but also to uh, introduce this in all of uh, Germany's uh, various states. So. We can see here that he's, you know, equating uh, facial recognition surveillance with other kinds of surveillance, and I really feel that the meaning about this, uh, the popular opinion, has changed. When I think back of my first Congress, where there was a study of uh, biometric surveillance, 
Informationspolitik. Um, that was, you know, back then we still had, there was information put out by the government. We, we, ha we had access to the study. We could read it, even though some uh, um, addendums weren't uh, made public. But now it's, uh, there are no numbers available anymore. And when we look at the statements uh, being made by politicians, uh, we can really see that there's they're not even trying to um, explain how this should work on a technical level. And the um, requests for uh, free information um, where we got a lot of uh, paper back, but uh, the main elements the, and the costs of these projects weren't made public. And again, this is uh, an unwillingness to lead a public discourse when people can't really see what this is all about, but we just we just get some small press releases from the ministry, and this isn't adequate at all, and that leads us into some sort of Trump propaganda sort of style where we can't even figure out whether something is right or wrong, where we can't even really figure out what's going on when we talk about national security, uh, fiscal interests, because of course, you know, there's private corporations involved here. So, um, yeah, this unwillingness really, uh, we need to fight that, and I want to fight that. I believe, you know, um, yeah, I sound a bit... Uh, also these angry right now, but uh, we really had fun at these protests, so that's what I want to point out. Yeah, this unwillingness on the side of the politicians, uh, like we're not going to tell you anything anymore, that's yeah, really uh, some, some other project where we can really see that is the uh, NSA Inquiry Committee. Um, Oh, wait, I, I still have to say something about the station at Südkreuz. <laughs> yeah, also dieser, dieser BND oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the uh, NSA BND Committee of Inquiry. Um, what, what, I don't know. What really happened there uh, came from the media, by which I mean Edward Snowden. And so this, this style of unwillingness to engage in discourse really uh, permeates uh, throughout all levels of government right now. All right, uh, two things. I really, really encourage you to read this long, very long um, report, uh, committee report. And uh, we even have uh, one that isn't blacked out at netspolitik.org. Um, so we can't really understand all of it because some of it refers to uh, secret information. But still, it's a good, um, good start to uh, inform yourself about what was going on. And of course, the pictures of Merkel being uh, uh, invited as a witness. Um, and again, uh, Mr. Ströbele yesterday, um, he really made this clear that this, you know, this probably won't have any consequences on a political level. You know, mass surveillance, uh, the Social Democrats and the uh, Christian Democrats, they're just, you know, like, uh, we don't care. So, yeah, uh, this again, um, as an example, uh, following the uh, revelations of Edward Snowden and mass surveillance, there's cases at the uh, EU Human Rights Court, and some of these cases were um, heard together at the court, um, which increased um, media attention. And I'm, I don't have any doubts about um, the EU Human Rights Court uh, deciding in our favor. But again, the argumentation of the uh, British um, spokesperson there, the, how they explained how mass surveillance is um, explained and their, their argumentation um, for mass surveillance is different from ours. So they're not even talking about data retention, data collection anymore. 
they so from the US we know you know that we're gonna collect a lot of data to find something but the British person said that we need this growing pile of data because we want to we want to keep working with that data we don't just want to find something but we we also want to in, increase that sort of surveillance of okay we don't have that much time um, what a surprise yeah so there's a lot more to be said about that there's also a recording uh, online and we're gonna uh, yeah uh, keep you informed and I, I really I don't have any doubts that uh, this sort of mass surveillance uh, doesn't go along with uh, EU um, human rights yeah a nice example of what happens when uh, wanna cry uh, there's no public uh, overwatch over intelligence services is wanna cry. Here we see um, patients data being centrally monitored and of course it's really bad when you get a crypto locker um, that uh, also uses some technical measures to um, permeate your whole network, which also led to the uh, info monitors of the Deutsche Bahn, German Railway, uh, not being that readable. And then they got out the old um, wooden signs and really uh, wrote by hand, the next train is uh, going to... Uh, and so, you know, it wasn't all bad, and uh, that's one cry. Um, so, yeah, what's really annoying, uh, let's um, talk about hospitals again. When we get the first news reports um, out of Great Britain, at least I got the first ones out of Great Britain, um, hospitals were hit by this attack and they had to work with pen and paper again. And so WannaCry struck hospitals, logistics, um, industrial production facilities. And of course all of these applications uh, share a similarity. Their niche software. And what I or we mean by this is software that has a very specific um, field of application. It's written by very specific small to middle-sized software companies. And it's all about very specialized um, handmade uh, software for dedicated uh, applications. For example, the computer that uh, runs an MRT scanner. And so a money printing machine uh, like an MRT scanner, that has to be run every day. And so you can't always you know, turn it off and turn it on again just to uh, install a new update. Um, so there's very few ca customers and they're being used 24-7, so they're not constantly updated because the uh, developer says, you know, we, we wrote the software and we can't just update it, so please run it on Windows XP. And of course, Windows XP isn't officially supported anymore, but we it's just... End of patches. It's not end of life, it's end of patches. But yeah, I just want to point out the problem uh, that exists. And we need to handle that. People need to handle that. You can't just, you know, um, hindsight is 2020, 20, and you can't just say, like, oh, hospitals um, have acted foolishly. So the, the weakness. The loophole that allowed WannaCry 
uh, was, as I mentioned, the SMB shares. And that was a zero-day vulnerability that the NSA sat on for years. And so, if I get the chronological order right, uh, starting in August, the shadow brokers um, stole all of those tools from the NSA. And so, it was very clear that the knowledge of this vulnerability was out, was not just with the NSA, but with an unknown group. So Microsoft patched this vulnerability uh, called Eternal Blue in March. So since March, this update was out. But only in April, the shadow brokers uh, released the vulnerability. So that could have, have happened every day, but even the shadow brokers had the ethical limitation, well, one month after Microsoft rolled out the patch. Uh, now we're going to uh, make this vulnerability public. So the NSA had this vulnerability for years and uh, never had the same ethical uh, limits. So uh, what I, the NSA, you know, it's not about ethics, it's about rules. So of course uh, they have, um, yeah, they weren't, uh, they didn't follow their uh, written rules. Mm, so it's not about ethical questions. And as a result, we can say that WannaCry is just part of the disaster that the NSA uh, uh, allowed to uh, happen and exist for years. I mean, this discussion, I mean, I have two more things about this. I mean, I think this discussion changed a bit because um, there's so many health organizations and um, facility organizations that were involved in this. There were so many. I mean, when it started in Great Britain, it was very clear that it was about life and death and health of people. And I think that really changed the discourse. But again, also, what I recognize is it's also a lot about money. And it was very clear the damages, the cost of damages. 4.8 uh, billion. Um, it was very interesting how the political and media coverage all of a sudden changed. I mean, interesting also is the discussion that the discussion, the media discussion, um, has uh, shifted towards CITES. Uh, there's a um, public office that is in charge of uh, security that is mainly dealing with system and machine hacking and the question whether this office is uh, going to publicize exploits and vulnerabilities or if they're going to make them publicly available and that's going to be interested to see in the upcoming month how this is going to be discussed. I think this is the discussion that we're going to have in Germany and we're going to see now and I think that's uh, the next subject for us which is uh, the security of uh, devices uh, with regards to botnets on IoT devices and routers and I mean all of this has con like been a big subject for all of us I mean, the collateral damage that happens between people, what was it? It was micro servers? I don't really remember, really. Anyways, um, the point here being that devices that are outside are being unsecure. Uh, we have old software on these devices. Producers of the devices don't really care. Uh, it's not really clear who's responsible. I mean, ultimately, as the producer of the device, uh, I mean, like, if WannaCry kind of sparked this discussion of who, whose responsibility is it to, uh, to maintain security. Um, the telecom router had um, political uh, representation um, because it, it caused for the politicians to, like, uh, really start talking about uh, lengthy uh, hearings uh, from the Ministry of the Inner as well as the Economic Ministry and the result of this hearing is a working group is called Router TR and they are supposed to uh, release a technical rule for plaster routers 
and uh, it's usually happening in Bonn and the rooms of the inner ministry. Uh, Linus went there once. Uh, he regularly goes there, actually. Um, the goal of this is to create some sort of official stamp and validation that this router is in compliance with technical up-to-date standards that at the moment is completely senseless. But interestingly enough, how strong the, uh, how reluctant people are to uh, write down security standards that are actually, and like it's, it's really interesting how like it's really hard for people themselves to create routers that are in compliance with security management, management measurements. And I mean like, it's like normal people are not allowed to put firmware on their own routers and it's there's this really like there's a lot of lobbyism that happens and that sabotage uh, and that goes to the point that officials are being sabotaged in and we just kind of I'm like I'm sorry but you can't deal with it like that and what then leads to things like our network is safe uh, and the whole room is laughing um, and then statements such as is that kind of like our retirement funds are safe yeah kind of like that uh, and I mean like we're, they, they have the they think that there should be like a End of life date, and, and there should be a sticker on there up to which point is there going to be security updates. Um, there's a round of applause for the demands of that. And this kind of position is something that we had a couple of years ago, and I'm like, we wanted to narrow it down to something that everybody understands, like IT security, so that you can that can be explainable to grammar. I mean, like every Apple has a date of best before, so why not technical so hardware? And like, if we put that on the routers, they're obviously not uh, they're not uh, safe anymore. And I mean, like, and I mean, that's obviously not just a problem concerning routers. I mean, like, this is something that we're demanding for every technical hardware, especially when we look at IoT, where there's no best before dates. And like, a lot of stuff is being done with like a quick thread and like under Hot Wheels, and there's no concern of that electronic garbage that's being created, all the bugs that are in these products. And I think it's really important important that we have regulatory measurements that secure that you, this is not being put out in the world and then that this this really weird strange IP camera that then kills the whole internet because it uses a standard password and I mean we've seen this, we've crossed this border we seriously have infrastructure problems because some garbage product is out there and nobody takes care of it. Interestingly enough um, there's this, there was this hearing that I went to in the uh, committee of uh, traffic uh, and I mean like our infrastructure is really in danger because we have so much garbage in there. If you look at uh, the media reports on this and what comes back from journalists when something's broken, uh, when there's something exploded or some sort of infrastructure broke down, it's, it's interesting like the, how suppliers um, have that attitude um, that they just expect somebody who finds a gap that they are bringing notice and then they'll resolve that issue and I think that's something that we really need to work on like you can't rely on problems being reported once it's already run ruled out and like there's no take on responsibility you go out in the world and when I buy a car and there's an accident that happens because the car doesn't work obviously the producer of the car is responsible and like when it comes to software we don't have this a round of applause. I mean, like, this is an old known truth. There's two ways of selling something without having any responsibility for it. One of them is drugs and the other is software. And both of the <laughs> producers are calling their client base a user. 
a round of applause for that. Interestingly enough, in this discussion we have, uh, especially with when it comes to the routers, we have uh, unexpected comrades and people joining our fight and they were supporting us. One of them is people like from the Bundesnetzagentur who are thinking about um, how can we stabilize the internet if we have 10 million unmaintained uh, products joining that internet? How are we supposed to uh, to uh, ensure these? So insurances and are the other interesting party that is on our side in this case. Um, and the subject IPv6 is coming up and the official uh, for information and security were like, their response to that was, oh, we're not going to think about that for now. Um, so uh, just to quickly show that we are also <laughs> like to travel, there were um, statements that were given in the EU Parliament uh, on the democratic discourse. So how are we going to, as a society, uh, interact with how the discourse slipping and what are ways to bring it back back and react and of course the subject that we just were hinting that we're talking about wanna cry what is what are our lessons learned of Internet of Things and who's responsible and who's going to take legal responsibility with these kind of things and um, especially after the German Parliament and government with the democratic principles is breaking with these democratic principles it's very, it was very interesting to be sitting in a parliament that really takes its time that has a lot of professionals and is interested in making some sort of change and that was really nice for a change to experience that i mean it's it's always a bit difficult for us we sometimes like to go to commissions and committees but of course this is hard because uh if you uh we obviously know the parliament and the municipal municipal parliaments better than uh, the European scale but to be honest like when I was there and I think Linus can agree with me when I go there it's not as ritualized it's it's my impression was that that it was there was more interest and more honest interest and more dialogue but you know I mean you can say all in all Europe is positive with certain regards, especially when it comes to regulations of net politics and digital aspects. Um, I mean, like, some of it is still changing. If some of you might have listened to the e-privacy lecture on the first day uh, that was dealing with uh, official release of data security. And I mean, like, every once in a while, we really should look to Brussels uh, there's a few regulations that are coming from the EU base that we really need to uh, look at and that they're going to change stuff for the better. And we should really look at the fact that these changes from Brussels are in our sense and our idea. And uh, there's obviously also the EDRI, the European Digital Rights Institution, and they obviously uh, they, they, they try to do that on the EU level and like it's uh, their great partner and a great NGO that we want to support and that's why I think we should mention them here. There's a round of applause from the audience from this. I think that it really fits uh, the European kind of context. So one of the things that where we kind of are very thankful that Europe exists and that's net neutrality. Uh, this year round we were dealing with that a lot. I mean in the beginning there was the stream on um, Terror, uh, stream on deal that the telecom ruled uh, um, made available and I mean especially uh, when it comes to net neutrality we dealt with stuff like that and in Europe we have a special case and we have a beautiful case where net neutrality is part of EU regulation and if I understand this correctly it's supposed to be executed directly so where something like the e USA where all of a sudden you have somebody that puts a new person in the FCC and you've got a council of five people that are overthrowing uh, fundamental rules in the EU, we are actually quite lucky and um, the 
dismantlement of net neutrality we're far away from. Um, and I mean, it's obviously giving us headaches here as well. Even if only European uh, companies are having to take a back seat in the US, for example. I mean, like, what a lot of people don't realize is that the disadvantage of some is always the disadvantagement of many. And like, it's, it's of course also if you block a VoIP supplier, and that's a bittersweet uh, present that the telecom has given us with stream on. Um, and I mean, you're standing there. So if they are capable to give them unlimited streaming with the prices that they pay, and if e only the offerings for big bandwidth or big streaming companies, then I don't understand why this inclusive volume can't be made available for all data. Okay, so basically Telecom Stream 1 uh, offers unlimited data streaming for certain suppliers. We're going to uh, take more action in this uh, field of work and this subject because um, obviously there's another one like Vodafone Pars where it's also zero rating and we're going to issue a, a statement that we're going to make publicly available probably sometimes around end of January. We want to position ourselves in this kind of discussion and the FCC discussion and decision in the US is going to start an interesting debate in the EU. I do think that we can position ourselves in a very different light and I do think that in Europe it seems to be possible. And the Bundesnetzagentur um, definitely is uh, looking at uh, the um, streaming made available by Vodafone and uh, Telekom as being against our version of net neutrality. Another subject that we're, we should be looking at Brussels for and where some good stuff happens from Brussels is, also, is uh, data retention, to be honest. Because in Germany we have a law that actually uh, deals with data retention and this law is not being executed, thankfully due to a ruling of a court in Nordrhein-Westfalen that, again, made that ruling based on the European Court of Law and that data retention without reason is not allowed and is not should not be made possible and that is and this obviously is in compliance with our idea about this so and this also is in line with what other courts have decided within Germany but the point that I'm trying to make here is that we really have to look at the timeline in 2015 our legislation our parliament wanted to do a new attempt at data retention and introduce data retention. And there was a law that was signed and that was supposed to go into action. And it actually did went into action in June this year, uh, no, in July. Um, and then last year, about a year after, uh, we kind of very, we got the ruling from the European High Court that unlimited data retention without any suspicion is not lawful. And then it was very clear that Germany is the only state in Europe, the only country in Europe that at the moment is being in compliance with European legislation and European laws because our parliament said that's not possible. We can't let this be happening and be in we need to be compliant with European law. And then they said, oh no, we'll do it anyways. So they really tried on the 1st of July to introduce data retention, and which obviously caused a lot of complaints. And there was... Uh, um, so one of the complaints filed on the lawful measurements was frozen, uh, but at the moment the state that it's in is that the law is signed, but it's not being executed. So this law is there, but I think we like need to uh, really work on this, uh, because this law is a law that is violating the European Constitution, and that's really not a joke. Like. Uh, you, I mean, the 
the way that we live within this European Union, like it's based on ethical morale and fundamental rights and of what be, it means to be human. And I think we need to really work on um, really dismantling this law. I mean, I think for now it's, it's, it's kind of this attitude of, well, we're not executing it thanks to the EU. Data retention is not happening in Germany. But at the same time, the law itself is still in place. It's there. Uh, there's a round of applause from the audience. Yeah, um, I think we covered quite a bit about hearings and judiciary, uh, judiciary practices and statements and, of course, we're the case computer club, so it's also about the fun on the machines. So now it's the fun part. So there's a few stuff and we want to just show you, show you some examples. How can you deal with security gaps? And we just want to do it with iterate through this on the base of two to three examples. And we didn't take include everything that we did. We just want to kind of show how different producers react towards gaps that are being uncovered. I mean, a lot of times uh, what happens that some of us addresses us, a lot of times I took on this responsibility and what happens then is I just go into call them up and I'm like, hey, hi, my name is Linus Neumann from the KS Computer Club and the responses I get are, they vary. Um, one of my most joyful ones was literally, shit, I never thought I'd get a call like this. There was big laughter and a big round of applause for that. But, I mean, that was, I mean, admittedly, it's the most fun when you get the, when you add the sentence, uh, you probably know why I'm calling. What happened for me once time is the response was like, how do I know this is true? I mean, like anybody could give me like a call. Uh, I mean, like, look at the attached exploit on the telephone. I mean, like, a lot of times you have that situation where you're like, I think that you have a problem and we'd like to help you out and solve you this problem. I think one of the elastic search clusters were all car sharing, bike sharing. Vehicles were uh, being tracked and capable to be tracked, and, and I mean that was closed. And we gave them like a really short time to fix this, and they they kept kept to what we asked for. And look at this, like one of the system. This is in a system where um, officials where you register and you go for your passports and stuff like that in Germany, where you could. Um, file for appointments. I mean, we blacked that out, but you could basically access all the database behind this. You could look at all the appointments made, what the appointments were made for. And I mean, obviously, this was one of the things that we were really shocked by, because that was obviously a vulnerability that was there for a long time. At on the other hand, the producer of this literally fixed it within two minutes. It was an SQL injection, and I told them, please go into that PHP file, uh, please change, take that parameter, and you're obviously handing that to the database, and that's what it's called. And the guy who's running it is like, oh, I looked at that shit. We usually do prepared statements. How the fuck did that happen? Thank you so much for the call. It is fixed in this second so while we were on the phone um, with him yeah, like that is something where you're like props where props is due um that was, I mean, like seeing in that situation, you also like it's one of those moments where you prevent, like, don't file a big press release when people fix it that quickly. I mean, like, there's other situations where you have to take different attitudes toward this. I mean, I think the thing that we forget here is what uh, the name of the database 
uh, yeah, I means. Is a bisschen anders. I mean, there's other scenarios where obviously the attitude towards what we find out is different. I mean, this is from last year. Uh, the German train company has done Wi-Fi on the trains, and I mean, like, they do digitalization, and they want to digitize everything. So that means that you can also go onto the internet while you're on the train, just like in any other state of uh, in, 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 on the world. And to, in order to do that, the train company just bought something, and they were like, oh, we got to do Wi-Fi, it's got to go quick. So I found out that that went to uh, one of the people on the high boards uh, and she let it slip that it like was kind of one of like a hot fix thing so there's a company called Icomera and that's up there in Scandinavia and it's like the world leader oh that's what they thought oh let's just you know shop there because there's like three people who do it well I found a scale like that and then you when you go onto the landing page you can very easily uh, by manipulating the uh, JavaScript, uh, understand who's getting on the Wi-Fi, where that person is, uh, where they are logged in, like all sorts of information that you could just kind of uh, scrape from that. Uh, they, well, they, they did get rid of that by uh, including JSONP endpoints, and that was then kind of good, but up until this year happened, and then this year we realized they just opened it up again. Like it's very simple. It was just it was just opened back up. So we then took the same JavaScript, and this time around did publish a press report, press release, and which they then responded to. Yeah, we closed it two days later. We issued the next press release. No, you did not. Um, you actually opened up a new vulnerability. So it's basically like you're picking up pieces from a project that's more than 110 million euros that they bought from a world-leading company that is not capable to solve these security issues properly and the producer of the and the producer that, uh, was actually like, oh, but like it's, it's actually quite good that it's like this because everything else just makes it really complicated. So they basically just wanted to leave that solution because it's a lot more simple to keep it open. But I mean, like, who cares about the clients who are on the users on the train? What's important and what matters is that the, the, the Wi-Fi works. So um, we obviously took a different attitude and we didn't notify the German train company before because companies are more and more relying on the fact that a month before something like that is being publicized, they are being notified and they get time to actually close these kind of gaps. And I mean, there's this story with the banking apps and we had this, like we, I mean, it's, it's, we then have to listen to them accusing us of not notifying them about these gaps. And I mean, like, it's, it's, it's stupid to have the app that we generate the tons for then doing banking. And I mean, like, there was a guy from a bank that then were like, oh, I mean, like, you should have just notified us. And I mean, like, we actually did. We, we notified you two years beforehand. And I mean, like, factically speaking, um, the train knew, like, the German train company knew for 110 million euros, they buy Wi-Fi, and then if they don't do it right, how about you don't turn it on on the day one, and you just push it back for another month, and you explain to the board why you have to do that. Like, how the heck do you rule out something that is so full of flaws? Uh, there's a big round of applause for that. And uh, the first example of this portal, if, if, if you do this for the first time, then it, it makes sense to responsibly disclose. But in this case, there's not a massive risk of uh, data getting lost at scale, of users being exposed immediately and being in, in, in grave danger. And um, this is where companies' interests have to take a 
step back from, uh, from users' interest. And as I said earlier, we are doing part of the communication for people who come up to us and say, hmm, can you help us? Some say, yeah, it might be that, and could you, and would you, and could you help me when, you, when I talk to the manufacturer who knows how they're going to react? and ask us to help in communication, especially with the examples I just showed you. Those were generated from the club, from, from without the club, and we supported them, we'd like to do so. And as it happened, uh, a similar plea came from a Jugendhakt, where some uh, Teenagers participating in Jugend hacked did what they do. They hacked and um, they might need my advice. And we know that this kind of situation doesn't always end very well. If um, we look back at the uh, hack of StudiVZ, the German Facebook clone from a few years back, and so I wrote a guest post at, uh, on the Jugendhack blog about our recommendations in dealing with manufacturers where I offered my support. And um, I traveled across Germany and uh, extinguished some fires where very young people found some very big flaws and um, we ensured that those got fixed. And this is a lot of fun. It's, it's <laughs> a lot of fun for everyone involved. The, the manufacturers just don't know how to show it. It's more of an Nein, aber also inward joy. No, but honestly, the, the manufacturers, of course, n nobody likes to have people stepping on their toes, but for these young people, after you've sat down to table and after I've told them, you're not going to, I, I cannot imagine that you want to threaten a child. I cannot imagine you mean what you just said. And then you, uh, <laughs> you are usually able to reinterpret the situation into, a, uh, into an internship or into a, an apprenticeship. But there are different examples in, of how manufacturers deal with these problems. There's a lot of variation. And we want to show you some of the most remarkable examples, one of them from this year, but maybe last year right, we told you things about one messenger that offered secure communication, but didn't really understand what secure communication means. So they promised end-to-end -end encryption and had none at all. Es ging jetzt über das Jahr noch ein bisschen hin. Also ich habe mit denen danach, ich habe von denen nichts mehr gehört. Uh, I didn't hear back from them, but a few months ago they came up to me and said, no, this is true, and um, they had rewritten all their software and asked us to update um, our communications. Um, so we did, and said the manufacturer said that uh, it's been it had been fixed. We were unable to test uh, to test it. <laughs> and uh, there was some back and forth, and they considered um, our blog post hate speech and thought they might need to sue us. I haven't heard back from them yet. I'm, I'm eager to see how this develops, but they are now certified secure. They found a company that certifies that the software now is secure until August 2018. No, don't laugh, it's not funny. It's actually fairly awful. We um, redacted the name of the issuing company, but anyone want to guess? You may be able to guess it, but we redacted it. Can 
Also was ich kann man sich ja googeln, die bewerben ja dieses Zertifikat. I mean, you can, you can google it, they're very proud of this certificate and they don't seem to have to reproach anything to themselves. I mean, if there is this certificate, then it's usually quite obvious who, um, who bought it. Also es gab dieses Geschäftsmodell früher schon mal, das uh, hieß Ablasshandel. And this business model is not new. It, um, it used to be Damals, called um, Im Mittelalter hat man dafür aber wenigstens noch so eine schöne handgemalte Urkunde Discharge. Heutzutage But in the in, uh, um in, in Details seines Word Processing zu kümmern. Church. Und, uh, yeah, the, the uh, church used to do this, but um, we try to find a nice illustrative example. And it feels like the um, people in charge uh, went to Congress and just didn't understand our stickers. Man muss sagen, vielleicht hätte der Hersteller das günstiger haben können. But maybe the manufacturer could have had could have done this cheaper. I mean. We, we give away these stickers, they could have just taken one and stuck it on their product. Yeah. Um Kommen wir nochmal darauf zurück, weil ich vorhin schon einwarf, weil ich mir nicht mehr bewusst war, dass wir da noch eine extra Folie hatten. Wir haben auch eine Stellungnahme abgegeben zum EID. We also sent out a statement on the EID Act, the Electronic Identification Act. And the, the, there is a chip embedded into German ID cards. Most Germans don't actually have it enabled and fewer yet use it. And there are very few places where you even can use it. So the Grand Coalition had the great idea of the, that they had to push this and um, <laughs> we can't ride a dead horse, but maybe we can force people to ride it. And this has uh, become law, so you're no longer you're no longer asked if you want to enable EID when you get a new ID card. Um, um, of course, I don't need a crystal ball to tell you that nobody's going to use this. <laughs> because there are no applications for it. Of course, they try to incentivize the, um, the part of the... Um, of uh, the, the applications, but that's not what I meant to talk about. So, um, the biggest part of this law was that when dass diese Daten nicht zentral gesammelt Biometrics were being embedded into passports. We were promised that there would not be a central biometric database. But of course, this um, turned into a problem, especially if you ha want to do automatic face recognition at Südkreuz Station in Berlin. And um, that means that we were quite astonished when we read this, um, this that all federal agencies are now allowed to centrally request all this biometric data. And it didn't even seem to be worthy of debate. There was some delay in this, uh, in this, in this process of, of writing this law. Um, and in the end, Parliament ended up making the situation worse. And of course, there was criticism, but no, no reaction, any shape or form. So now we have this automated access, and the protocoling is happening on the on the side of those requesting access. So it's impossible to know who's accessing data, there could be a shadow database where there would not even be any protocoling. So it's, it's, it's apparently possible to make it centrally accessible, but we can't have any central logging because that would be too much effort. And when you 
It's really, it's really yeah. terrifying to think about what what this is going to enable. And uh, the law aims to make EID as accessible as possible to people or as usable as possible to people. And this chip is embedded into all passports and ID cards. And for years, there's been um, people have wondered how to um, how to kill this chip. And um, central databases are part of another debate as well. I mean, not everybody needs a new ID card all the time, but passports are a thing. And one thing changed significantly last year that's in contravention of the law, and that's um, the passport. And on the 7th of April, the European uh, border codex has been changed, and now biometric data has to be read whenever you cross the Schengen border and has to be correlated with um, law enforcement databases to prevent terrorism. So this data is being read from the documents and being sent somewhere in the um, respective states. But the German law states that this data can only be used to verify the the identity of the bearer of the document. So we felt forced on that very day to explain that there are ways of disabling that chip. It's not recommended by the manufacturer, but there are some very handy devices. I brought something along. There are manufacturers on the market that produce this kind of thing. It's a very useful device for disabling um, <laughs> For disabling um, identity documents, and you can actually use. Um, the, uh, I've seen it in hacker spaces as well. It's the mobile version of um, of, uh, of an inductive stove. Um, let me just get it wired up. <laughs> Wir können damit nämlich auch äh, mit Sicherheit zeigen, dass wir gegen zu dem will be able to uh, we, we, unlike, unlike putting this in the microwave, we're going to be able to okay. prove to you that this is not going to uh, cause wie, wie, ey, any burns. <laughs> Also es eine, diese Induktionskochfelder senden so kleine Impulse. So these um, induction uh, stoves send impulses to... Yeah. I mean, this, this said something about 2,000 watts. It's very experimental. I'm, I'm going to set it to maximum. That should be enough. The noise is normal. <laughs> And all you need to do, it, it happens quite quickly. <laughs> Just stir, and it should be well done. It, it looks the same as earlier. It, it still works as an identity document, just no longer electronically. And this should be part of the digital literacy, digital emancipation um, Series. And um, because we have to expect other ideas from our Minister of the Interior in, in future, this is maybe something you want to consider. All right. Then there was another topic uh, this year in Germany, the uh, G20 summit. Der Chaos Computer Club so an dem Punkt, wo sagt, okay, es gibt irgendwie. There we also reach a point uh, as the Chaos Computer Club. We're a association of hackers. But where do we reach the point of 
What can we actually do? What can people associated with this club do? And when we're talking about uh, general political activism, we see that there's uh, different uh, different groups within the club um, that maybe you know get together and uh, do something that uh, too but and the Berlin group, yeah, they were, you know, somehow angry about this, uh, this meeting in Hamburg, and there wasn't anything done in Berlin. So we had the G23 summit in Berlin, a small little event uh, with uh, lots of nice people that met one month before the G20 summit in Hamburg and just, you know, uh, networked for a little bit, uh, exchanged experience. And also, uh, at the G20 summit itself, parts of CCC uh, went there and organized uh, a media center um, working together with the Freedom Care Media Center um, that provided uh, live streams and uh, opportunities to f for journalists from all over the world to work together. And I, I really feel that this sort of activism uh, also stands for uh, the CCC. Uh, it's really uh, people working so very hard, um, putting themselves at risk and doing what we do best, building infrastructure. And uh, that's great. And uh, applause for that. So, one example, uh, people from the club worked all throughout the year to support different uh, events, especially the uh, VOC, a video group, um, for all sorts of different political uh, events. And so we as hackers have the opportunity to make a difference, to engage, to uh, bring uh, a connection to places that need it, and that is one uh, one aspect where the CCC really is able to make a difference because other organizations and associations are uh, quite helpless sometimes. So, yeah, helpless organizations. Um, uh, that brings us right to the uh, German federal election 2017, where to look at a uh, election software. And leading up to that, this project was brought to us by Kai Biermann from the German uh, uh, news site, Site Online. He said, you know, I've, I've got this student here, and he said he sort of hacked the Hesse election. And yeah, we said, all right, let's uh, have a look at this. Um, and working together with Martin Schiersig, the student from Darmstadt, we, uh, we looked at this and uh, found that, you know, yeah, this is uh, quite nice, but before we, you know, make this public, let's see what else we can find. And then at the end we had a 23-page report where we listed every vulnerability that we found, uh, listed, uh, gave all the details and explained various attack scenarios for attacking this um, election software. And so this hack that Martin did to, in which he could have manipulated all of the HESI election results centrally, um, you know, we were like, ah, oh, this would be nice if we could do this on the uh, federal level. And so working together with Thorsten Schröder, we uh, dug a little deeper, and I'm going to, you know, skip a few details here because we had a talk on this yesterday. You can uh, see and listen to that on uh, media.ccc.de. Uh, 
uh, great recording. Uh, thanks to the VOC again, Video Operations Center. And we're very proud, um, you know, to um, having uh, used the lack of updates and lack of encryption. In Anlehnung an die uh, something we call Quellentelekommunikationsmanipulation, so source telecommunications manipulation, uh, uh, play on words um, about uh, yeah, um, surveillance of telecommunication. Um, so, as always, we as the uh, CCC approach the uh, vendor. Uh, Kai Biermann was very helpful and facilitated the communication. And it, it truly was a um, uh, a clay pigeon shooting. Um, so it was um, quite easy for us to find these vulnerabilities, and we always. Uh, yeah, we showed them what to do and uh, told them about uh, signed updates. Uh, but yeah, it all fell over again and it was just uh, back and forth, back and forth uh, over multiple releases and on the 19th of September we realized that we, uh, the vendor, isn't uh, able to provide an update mechanism, and so we just released our own security fix uh, as open source. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it's about the uh, federal election, so, you know, uh, yesterday we, we also pointed out that we have some sort of respons responsibility there. We wanted to vote also. You mean you only wanted to give one vote? Yeah, so uh, it might have gotten through that our cooperation um, is, uh, depends on how well we can work together with a vendor, a software vendor. And uh, the yeah, the developers here didn't just screw up the technical side because, of course, our, our sort of little open source update mechanism gift, it was pretty clear that they wouldn't implement that. Instead, they said, uh, well, you know, if the updates are the problem, then there's just not going to be any updates anymore. And so, a few days before the federal election, they just stopped all updates. They publicly stated there won't be any online updates anymore. Uh, and uh, said that if you wanted to update the software, you should contact the uh, counselor. Um, so, yeah, uh, so this is an update mechanism that is in need of a special counselor, uh, which just isn't acceptable. So, a few days uh, before the federal election, all versions of the software, software still were critically vulnerable. Um, they wouldn't be fixed, we knew that, and so from the various uh, voting stations, we heard that, uh, well, we're using, you know, you, you've in your report, uh, you've talked about uh, 2017 software being vulnerable, but we still use one from 2015, so is that affected as well? And that really, uh, yeah, sends shivers down our spine, so... Uh, of course, we also. Um, uh, this was this was a lot of work uh, writing the patches the, uh, ourselves, and uh, we uh, made some demands as well. So these demands um, concerning uh, voting software, voting computers, um, they. We're not only against voting machines, voting computers, we're also about assisting voting machines. So, for us, uh, security um, uh, and dependency are very important uh, with these 
uh, machines and we just don't see that in the software and the, the software that is used in elections can't be secret it mustn't be secret and there's a round of applause for that ja. und das heißt die das heißt wir brauchen also so we need not only open source software but in the election offices all throughout the election process we need uh, auditing we need access to the software we need uh, source code being published and these demands especially the demand for open source software within this realm um, got a great response on an international level um, because that really um, struck a nerve in the US they the same problem exists in the US but uh, it's a lot more severe and so the big bad cyber Russian uh, was uh, looming at the door and due to this international collaboration um, we're hopeful that um, until the next federal election rolls around we're gonna you know have our demands met yeah and a lot of uh, people signed this campaign and we also want to mention a um, response by the federal election uh, officer just just because no one ever looked at a certain software, you know, it doesn't mean that it's better. So, the election officer, you know, they said, well, you know, we also use Microsoft Office. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, there's still a lot of work to do there. And this is so sad because it really would be possible to uh, count all of Germany's federal election using open source software and having open source software all throughout that process. And then we could just uh, be like, you know, git pull um, count votes dot py. Um, and but all we have today is, you know, a huge waste of resources and money, and that gives us intransparency and vulnerability. And it would be so nice to use these public funds um, and public software to uh, realize uh, an election. And I really don't understand why that doesn't happen. Um, regarding this, every time you ask on the state level, they always say that, you know, um, you, we have security uh, by obscurity, uh, as every computer scientist knows. So, uh, the f um, FDP Liberal Party of Germany had this nice um, election slogan, uh, which we um, modified slightly. So, uh, think first, digital second, that's what it says. Ja, ähm, wir kommen so langsam zum Schluss. Ähm, wie schon mehrfach erwähnt, ähm, haben wir... Um, we're coming to a close, almost. As mentioned before, there's lots of local events within the Chaos, Com Chaos Computer Club community. And we have to sort of start with like uh, scrolling here, trying to um, give you an overview of everything that happened throughout the year and you know the, we probably missed a few um, but on events.ccc.de there's always uh, the whole list I'm just gonna you know run it again we're so nice and you know the question uh, where's the next event there's uh, the website I just mentioned um, um, there's uh, blog posts and these events are much smaller than 
Congress, but they're really, really nice, and it's uh, they're great opportunities to get in touch with people, get to know people, uh, especially you know people from the same area as you. And so, uh, I really want to encourage you to uh, check uh, out those local events and um, participate there. And that uh, is it for today. Uh, thanks very much for.